A warm welcome to all of you to this 80-minute session on harnessing the human uh, other scientists for human security for all. Also, warm welcome from our commentator Diana uh, Aiton Schenker. Human Security for All is a project of the World Academy of Art Science Association with the UN headquarters. It is sitting at the center of future development. It is a unifying team and that serves a call for aim of rest to enhance the of a wide range of high objectives. Human security must be as a first benchmark, effective development strategies in the future in all directions. Before I, before I leave the floor for the panelists, please let me introduce yourself very briefly, make some remarks on the framing of the same, and then to hand over to Schenker to do the same. I am found holder UNESCO chair on global understanding for sustainability at the Friedrich Schiller University of Vienna, the initiator of the International of Global Understanding of the leading global science organization, the Natural, Social, and Human Sciences in 2016, and the, and the co-moderator of this session, as already said, with Diana A. Checker. Placing you at the center of all future developments, call and respect of the current dominant approach for a shift in perspective on the planet Earth or nature in general, focus on traditions beings as actors with their cultural and social as well as and as being part of nature and transforming it in accordance with mentioned backgrounds and for objective purposes. If one assumes that we humans transform nature for our purposes and that these purposes depend on our culture, then it is obvious that sustainability and for all claims need to be built on a cultural basis and not primarily from the environment. Acceptance that implies the need for a double shift of paradigm in the uh, policies. The first shift calls for a radical change from down to a bottom-up strategy. And for a change of the starting point from nature and environment these two shifts include, in fact, a third one. Human security for all only can only be achieved by a change in local practices in respect of the control conditions. The implementation of these shifts are, in my view, the precondition for wrapping up the harnessing of the humanities for human security. They lead to the vision are no natural disasters, looking at precisely. There are just natural events that be disasters because of this ways of humans to deal with nature. This is how I see the context of this session. I'd like to add also the another for is yours. Thank you so much, Benno, and uh, thank you to the Academy, the World Academy of Art Science. I'm so privileged and uh, happy to be here. Thank you to our colleagues, Gary and um, Janani. Before I introduce our wonderful panelists, Lucy Atala, uh, Dennis Zakharopoulos, and uh, uh, Mila Popovich, I want to uh, introduce myself and share some of my thoughts in framing this discussion on harnessing humanities for human security. Harnessing humanities 
for human security has at its heart humanity, humanities, human security. This matters so much today, and it matters as we look towards not only the summit of the future, but the moment of today that invites and envisions that future. So I'm privileged to be coming into this conversation as CEO of Leonardo ISAS, the International Society of Art, Science and Technology, and as Executive Director of our partnership with Arizona State University, where I serve as Professor of Practice and Senior Global Future, Global Future Scientist at the Julie Ann Wrigley Global Futures Lab, an interplanetary scholar with the ASU Interplanetary Initiative. I also bring to this conversation my lens as an entrepreneur, international human rights lawyer, philanthropic innovator, and uh, uh, author of four books, three on multilateral engagement, um, two on the United Nations and one on the international community, more inclusively that incorporates the work of this agency. When we think about harnessing humanity for human security, we must imagine and unleash our imagination to embrace a new paradigm for multilateral agency and architecture, including this academy, one that reflects this vision of human security for all, meaning a world in which humans live in uh, freedom from fear, freedom from want, and freedom to live with dignity. Now, I suggest that one way to frame that harnessing of humanity is a different kind of paradigm shift than uh, 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 Benno was introducing um, that perhaps builds on or, or gives context. Uh, this is the paradigm shift, not for the future, but for what I see as having already begun, a paradigm shift we are in now from an extractive system noted by the key drivers uh, to contain, control, and conquer into a regenerative system with the key drivers to empathize, collaborate, and co-create. How might we come into a regenerative system, this systemic paradigm shift to harness humanity for hu human uh, security for all by empathizing, by co-creating, by uh, collaborating. We do this at the heart of our work with humanities, our interdisciplinary work, our work that draws on hybrid creativity across art, science, technology, and all the arena of human engagement. We do not do this in isolation from nature, nor in a binary of movement from uh, uh, nature guiding our actions or our actions as a species guiding nature, but recognizing the complexity of our interdependence, that we are a natural species, we are creating and part of natural systems that reflect who we are as living organisms. So it's less of a, uh, a shift from nature to culture or from culture to nature, rather a shift in our mindset that we are nature and as natural beings, we shape our future and we do so together. That kind of collaborative, empathetic co-creation requires the vision of the humanities. And this is why and how the humanities are so essential to harness to really bring about that human security for all to live 
it, with dignity, free from fear and free from want. Uh, uh, that requires further giving space and currency to the visionaries who can see this change that we want to be. In order to see the change that we want to be, building on Gandhi's imperative to be the change we want to see and embody our future, we have to first envision it. And as uh, our colleague Maria Fernanda Espinosa said in the opening session yesterday, to envision a future, and I would go even further and envision a present in which humans live with dignity, free from fear and want, is not too much to ask. It should be our baseline. And as Gary pointed out in the opening session as well, there's a fundamental question that I think drives me in coming to this conversation that I'll turn over to uh, the panelists in introducing themselves. And that's why now? Why does this matter so much now? As, as uh, uh, our, our colleague uh, um, uh, Ketan Patel uh, suggested in his work with Force for Good, we actually have solutions. What we need is the will, the mobilization, the capacity to act on these uh, uh, so strategy. So before we come into the conversation about solutions and strategies from your experience, I'm going to invite the panelists to introduce themselves and share how you're coming to this conversation, framing how we harness human, uh, humanities for human security and share with us your key ideas uh, through that introduction. And I'll begin uh, with Lucy Atala. Thanks, Diana. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm happy to be here. So my name is Lucy Atala, and I'm an environmental anthropologist um, who has a social anthropology background. Um, I work in Wales at the moment, but my most of my fieldwork has been done uh, looking at water insecurity in Asal regions of, of primarily northeast Kenya, where subsistence horticultural culturalists live without piped water and who are suffering um, in countless ways. Um, but more recently, I've adopted uh, an interdisciplinary new materialities focus, which uh, aims to demonstrate our dependency on the physical world. And so I've done this firstly by looking at water's physical behaviors um, and then map those against its role in shaping the way the Giriyama people of the region I've been working in um, understand what it means to be human. So there's, a, there's almost a direct correlation between the behaviors of water with some of their sort of the core of their cultural ideas. Um, and so I've, now I've started using that method in other locations, uh, in Spain, in Wales, and then more recently in Colombia with a group of people called the Kogi in Santa Marta. Um, so in association with that, I co-edit a series of books uh, with my colleague who's an, who's an, who's an archaeologist, so it's an archant kind of collaboration. Um, her name is Professor Steele. And the book series looks at how different entities shape humanity and so we've published on water and on bodies, on plants, on soil, on the earth, and so on. And we're moving to food. Hooray, we get to eat. <laughs> and uh, and all of this is in an attempt to, they're very accessible books, so it's in an attempt to dethrone the human, to make that kind of normal, and to challenge human exceptionalism. Um, and, and basically, it's a reminder that existence is relational, that we're all in relationship, and we're in this together. Um, with the plants and water and so on yeah but so i think i'm here today uh because i'm the, also the deputy executive director of unesco bridges program which um addresses the sdgs and it does that by using 
a bit of a mouthful, a transdisciplinary humanities informed sustainability science. It's a mouthful we're going to have to get our head around a little bit. Um, so, you know, what on earth is this mouthful, you ask probably? Um, well, let me just first tell you why Bridges exists at all. And Bridges is the first program of its kind in the UN family of organizations. And its founding members, UNESCO, the Humanities for the Environment, and the International Council for, for Philosophy and Human Sciences, birthed Bridges for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because they recognized that despite all our best intentions, the sustainable development goals are simply not going to be realized. Um, not at the pace and scale that's necessary. And so this casts very serious doubts on some of, it, or any of these targets being reached, really. And secondly, because product innovation and technology and technological advances are frequently less effective than local person community-centered projects that render very complex ideas, often very complicated ideas, uh, uh, and systems into more manageable interpersonal and intersectoral collaborations. And so because of these two facts, the founding partners resolved to establish a body to strengthen the sustainability science domain by instrumentally and meaningfully including the humanities, put next to that in brackets, and the arts, in all research projects from the very outset from the research question stage. So this is a fundamental shift. So Bridges uses then a sort of broad and inclusive de definition of humanities, because I think it's worth noting, particularly for a panel that's talking about the humanities, that the word humanities is actually quite complicated <laughs> and it doesn't always translate that well. Um, and actually the same applies to the word science. It, it's used very differently depending on what culture or cult country you come from. So what is considered a humanities subject can vary really dramatically depending on who you're talking to. And in some areas, this has caused some friction. And in others, it's caused a rather strange knowledge hierarchy with certain subjects being thought of as better than others. And for some, it actually causes damage to how people are able to, to know of the world. So I'd like to argue here that these are quite unnecessary, uncomfortable labels um, that do more than just categorize. In fact, they accentuate some divisions um, within what, for, for people's lived reality, is really a blended knowledge landscape. So let's remember the physicist poets, the artist engineers, the clergy scientists, the indigenous ecologists, the people who work with the stories from the ancestors, the biologists who got inspiration from their dreams. Remember DNA and James Watson with his dream. So, you know, those rigid boundaries sort of slightly misrepresent the lived realities that we all, you know, go through. And we need to acknowledge that uh, some perspectives or methods or, or subjects you know, e e even with this lived reality, some subjects have a have a louder voice and a seat at the table, um, which kind of valorizes them and certain approaches over others. And, and this is starting to marginalize certain skills and the insights of others. And so that's what I think this panel is really about. Um, and to remedy that then, Bridges is actively encouraging the creative sort of cross-fertilization of methods and, and this is quite a, a task. Um, Cross-fertilizations of methods, of, of understandings, of theories, drawing different approaches together, you know, with the values of the humanities, plus a whole load of other voices into conversation to even start to think about what a problem actually looks like rather than even just how to address them. So really getting right into the core of this. We're labeling certain things problems, what are they? Is the big question. Have I nearly run out of time? Have I run you've out of time? You've run out of time, but you've <laughs> also um, okay. run up this great ramp of introduction that uh, is, is just wonderful pulling together so many strands. And in framing uh, this conversation, I'm going to move us towards um, Mila uh, Popovich to uh, follow on. Thank you so much, Lucy, and welcome, Mila. Thank you so much. Wonderful to be here with you. I just first of all want to congratulate the World Academy of Art and Science on its 64th birthday. And every year 
needs to be a year of revitalization and a year of self-reflection, which I think this is the moment for our, our gathering, uh, for a values-based organization, for a living organization, this is necessary to reapply itself, reevaluate itself and reapply itself towards the demands of the day. And I really hope and expect that us coming together and showing up in the public space like this re-energizes the World Academy to take its proper place and its proper purpose in the world that was um, you know, based in its foundation. So really happy to be here, uh, to say hello to all of my friends, to all of the colleagues and all the panelists, uh, and to once again wish uh, the World Academy six, happy 64th and uh, many more of good, valuable work. So I am um, plugging in today, as the youth would say, from Montenegro uh, and uh, working right now both in the U.S. and Montenegro so in some ways, um, at the center of the world, uh, at the center of the political, military, economic power, um, and also um, at another center, a tiny country at the intersection of East and West is kind of a portal and a doorway between worlds, um, which offers a significant, um, really meaningful perspective on what is going on in the world on the periphery of NATO, at the center of the old world, um, at the center of the birthing of new things in Europe. These are just some pointers um, as to what Montenegro is right now and why it's significant to speak of it. So I will go towards why I'm mentioning the country where I'm working right now is because of what we have created in the country to apply the knowledge of humanities to policy making, to institutional innovation, to moving social fronts for social transformation in the country, in the region of the Western Balkans, which as you know, history tells us has been a, um, an explosive region um, and needs to be the peacemaker um, right now at, because it's a linchpin in the Balkans and it's a linchpin in that sense for stability and security in Europe that is being challenged right now through um, all the geostrategic events and environmental events and economic challenges that we see right now. So this is a little bit of a kind of a, a macro picture and references that I wanted to offer and to inform you how it is that we are applying the integrated, unified, federated knowledge of which we are speaking right now, unifying that knowledge to apply ourselves in the political arena. I will give a couple of insights before that um, based on the values and vision uh, that ties both the uh, values and vision of, of uh, World Academy with this uh, project and institution that I'm running here. So this was a, an unusual introduction. I'm a trustee of the World Academy, a founder of Evolving Leadership, consultancy for organizational development, planetary pathfinding, as well as individual excellence. And right now in the role of director general, of the Directorate for Interculturalism at the Ministry of Human and Minority Rights in the government of Montenegro. And this is a institutional innovation that was um, started or established by the government in 2022, right after or at the very tail end of COVID, uh, which is very significant because for a, a country that is so ancient and set in its ways in so many ways, um, I think the very crisis of COVID generated an opportunity of which we so often speak in the World Academy of seizing the moment and seizing the most opportune critical time to create positive change. This is exactly what happened here. And I was invited as a foreign expert. I am originally from former Yugoslavia and Montenegro, but also a naturalized American and I was perceived as an American, as a foreign expert. This intentionally mentioned just to kind of showcase the spectrum of identities that we have as artists and scientists and multidimensional beings that we all need to bring to the forefront and engage for the social transformation that we need. So I was invited by the government as a foreign expert to create something um, that will generate 
social cohesion that is so much needed in a very divided country, only to uh, realize, as you all now know, how deeply divided uh, the world is. And what we are witnessing right now is collapse of social bonds um, to the point where we have a crisis of social cohesion on which everything rests. In fact, I will go so far to say that humanity needs a new social contract based and sourced in universal human rights and responsibilities and universal humanistic values for true peace, actual sustainability, and human security for all. Everything rests on social cohesion, renewal of social bonds, re-energizing trust in communities, in institutions, in social leadership, and most certainly um, in generating social movements for so global social transformation. Simply, this country, USA, the entire world, needs a new story, needs a new vision, which I think, as I think Diana mentioned, is already emerging. It is already on its way. The question is, how can we harness the social energy that is already moving, harness it in a positive, constructive, transformational way, instead of letting it resort to violence, conflict, and mayhem or chaos that will cause us uh, serious issues long-term. So now is this most opportune moment to harness the social energy that is already rising in the youth in reaction to what's going on in the world, in reaction to um, the future that is profoundly uncertain um, and to harness it for the good as we now often speak in the World Academy for the good. The role of the Academy in any um, values-based organization is really, really significant in um, devising, designing, and convening forces and resources for generating the new social contract that will determine the price and value of everything and that will most certainly heal the biosocial conflict on which all of our systems are based. All of our systems are indeed based on the biosocial conflict, on the nature <laughs> put against the globe, if you will, and all the social systems, first of all, exploiting the natural resources on different demographics, exploiting and abusing uh, each other's resources. It starts from individual relationships scaled up all the way to institutional, um, global institutional structures and systems. So we need to heal the, and re, reassess the biosocial conflict to generate new systems of care and support to generate new sense of authority, especially moral authority based on life affirming values and life affirming systems that can sustain all of us. And to of course, dedicate time to understand what Lucy was speaking about that our entire existence is relational. And to that effect, what mm, our work in the Directorate for Interculturalism is based on is to repeat universal human rights and responsibilities and universal humanistic values and on what we call the culture of interbeing, which is, again, unifying the spiritual and scientific knowledge as some ancient spiritual traditions have shown us but science is more and more proving to us that we are indeed relational beings, that, we, that all life forms, all beings, all phenomena are interdependent and interconnected. Based on that, what, kind of, what kind of ethics, what kind of economics, what kind of politics uh, do we need to devise uh, in order to adhere to the core spiritual and scientific principles that we talk about. And in that sense, maybe I'll just point towards um, three key principles and models uh, that we are building, our peaceful coexistence and conviviality 
because all the cultures, all the societies are multicultural, but sometimes that multiculturality is being abused and misused to keep us as islands in the ocean rather than with this understanding and with this integrated knowledge that we speak about. So it's peaceful coexistence, it's solidarity in all of our systems based on solidarity and of course co-responsibility for shared futures because of the fact that we have to reassess our way of being, belonging and becoming as the great human need for all of these is arising and as the great human aspiration for unity and diversity to round off with this fantastic motto of the World Academy is rising in youth, in the streets, in institutions. And we are trying to demonstrate that it is possible in a small country at a critical place, at a critical time, to model that for the world and add a key note to, to the greater harmony in humanity. Thank you so much. And I, I, I'm uh, in, inspired by the range of uh, uh, ideas and, and um, uh, movement that you're pulling together here as interdependent, intersectional, I think that uh, is an in, in, important reflection on um, Lucy's introduction as well and Benno's framing. So with that integration and uh, interdependence, let me um, invite our third panelist to introduce himself and uh, uh, welcome very much uh, Dennis to the conversation. Um, thank you so much for being here today. Hello, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you to the World Academy of Art and Sciences, which is always very inspiring with uh, all the events they are uh, creating so that uh, make us think and reconsider a lot of things. Uh, I would say that uh, in order to participate really and to thank you today for this uh, meeting, uh, I have already a few uh, great and positive uh, feelings and some very negative experiences. The negative experience is technology. Since my new hearing aids, they don't get uh, a good quality of sound. So I hear very badly most of what you say. And it is to say, not about me, but about, in, about the general problem, that the quality of transmission of uh, technology is in, unfortunately uh, interfering very hard into what we could call culture and art and information and whatever. So uh, I guess that one thing that uh, damages uh, the world situation and create always travels for security is not necessarily misunderstanding or misinformation. It's already the difficulty to reach even a bad information because you have previously like a, a bad tool or at least a tool that pretends to be good but pretends to be perfect and people believe that technology is a perfect tool and it is extremely poor. I mean, if now instead of you, I should have here an orchestra uh, or even a, a pianist or a violin. If Einstein would have played his violin and not talk about his theories, we would be perfectly unable to appreciate what a violin is. And insofar I am concerned with both topics, the one is the arts and the other is humanities. Uh, humanities are definitely a way to reconsider how we relate to human experiences and human practices, either historically or psychologically or sociologically or whatever you want. Uh, nevertheless, if the sound or the matter, the material quality of things is uh, 
not sufficient. It is like a very good uh, recipe and a great cook with a bad meat and a bad vegetable. Uh, it will be a very interesting attempt, but a very poor result because imagination is not necessarily the first quality we need. To be able to distinguish, let's say, a good meat from a bad meat, a fresh vegetable from an old vegetable, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is what makes but an artist, for instance, makes his work choosing always the best he could find and the best he could do. And this is also the way uh, in the humanities, at least during the 20th century or after the end of the 19th century, uh, we grew up with an idea. I grew up myself in European studies in university and most of my professors are very much honored still, were people much older than me, even older than the generation of my parents, people they were active, many of them before the war. And they were bringing with them, let's say, a dream of a different century. Uh, therefore, I, I found so important and such an honor for me to be a fellow in this academy because somehow, the, the challenge of this academy was how, not only how to consider future in a futuristic way, but how to go back in what made that the present already of the last war was such a catastrophe that we should really reconsider. And therefore people like Bertrand Russell or Oppenheimer or, or uh, Einstein or, 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 or all these people, they had really to create what we call today ethics, but it, it's a poor concept if you keep it, let's say, on a legal level. Uh, definitely the arts is a matter of ethics. If you play a correct sound when you play your violin, that Einstein knew it perfectly. You cannot speculate about it. It is it it's right or wrong. It's 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 tuned or out of tune, and that is an ethical question. It's not an aesthetical question. Therefore, most of scientists, writers, artists in the field of human experiences after the war and until recently and perhaps until now, they care much more about the dissonances than about harmony. Because harmony is something you can, we can work on harmony, like consensus. All our institutions are made on consensus. So we can go away and say, congratulations, we had a good panel, we met each other, we, we are all beautiful or interesting people. But if we come to the point, if we have to speak about one single word, not all the blah, blah of all of us. I guess we would immediately find how far we are from meaning the same thing with one single word. And this wooden language we are using most of the time, the jargon of international institutions, of, uh, uh, in, uh, of cultural industries, of political a talk of television and whatever. I mean, all, all, all this construction of a fake consensus. It is like you build a nice building and what is nice in this building? Everything is already decided before. You have all the rules given by the law. So you respect this. You don't invent anything. In fact, our, I mean, artists, in, there is such a, such a uh, demand for innovation, but artists become more and more reactionary in that sense. They don't innovate. They, the, the new thing for an artist, it will stick back to the old, the old stuff. Uh, what we are going to, to forget, what we are abandoning, 
in terms of what? In terms of a fake innovation? Innovation for what? Uh, it doesn't mean there is no innovation, but it is a very, it needs a lot of struggle to invent something. Uh, 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 story, uh, if I'm long, uh, we'll let, Continue when Malraux story. visited the United States, uh, uh, invited with the Kennedys, etc. Uh, the de Menil French, very rich family, made an extraordinary dinner with the Kennedys and every all the New York stuff and American stuff, uh, a, a good society to please Malraux. And they asked Malraux if there was somebody in the States he would like to meet. Malraux thought and said, yes, there is one person, Einstein. Great trouble for Mrs. de Menil, how to put the same table, Kennedy, Mrs. Kennedy, Einstein, Malraux, and all the... So she found a good idea to make separate tables. So in the middle was one round table with Malraux and Einstein, and all the others, Mrs. Kennedy, Mr. Kennedy, uh, Mr. de Menil, Mrs. de Menil, etc. When Malraux arrived, he was a very brilliant man. He was talking to everybody. And at the end of the blah, 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 the mundane things, he goes to the table where Einstein was in his little jacket sitting. And Malraux speaks, oh, I'm honored, etc., etc. Einstein, thank you. And Malot takes out a little block and a pen and said, are you going to take notes? I said, no, but you know, I have so many ideas. If I don't put them down, I will forget them. Einstein said, oh, lucky you. I'm afraid if I ever would have one idea in my life, I would never forget. <laughs> and that is exactly the problem of our time. We have so many ideas. But who is able to have one idea? It will be the idea of his life that will stick for life like Einstein. And Einstein, I believe, was as much an artist as a scientist. Not only- Well, that's a, a wonderful, that's a wonderful note to um, transition because that, uh, that intersectional a uh, blended identity of an artist and scientist is very much at the heart of who we are here mm -hmm. in, in this session, who we are as a species on the planet, how we understand coming to these big questions of so many ideas coalescing around a central purpose to bring uh, by harnessing humanity truly the humanity is truly uh, a human security for all. So with that, I'm going to um, hold myself back from jumping onto the many things that inspired me from these three rich introductions um, with a, a great appreciation for the technology that serves us and our own ingenuity to troubleshoot when we have um, some some challenges. So we want to shift to inviting your solutions and strategies. What's working uh, in harnessing humanities for human security for all through your work? And to better focus your contributions to this discussion, uh, Benno had suggested keeping in mind three questions in particular, however is helpful for you. So one, what are the experiences uh, from your own background in humanities of the transdisciplinary work that, that's having an impact so far? Um, two, uh, from the point of view of humanities, how do you see human security for all? And three, what do you envision as the role humanities can play in the future to improve human security for all? I think that these wonderful questions from Benno help um, uh, suggest ways that you could uh, illuminate for us some solutions and strategies from your experience and perspective. Benno, I hope that that captured uh, what we wanted to bring out next. Okay, um, so let me begin with you, Mila, uh, in sharing, and maybe we'll, we'll take a few minutes each uh, and uh, 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 welcome your thoughts. Thank you so much. Maybe the best way to speak about these questions is through enacting a vision. 
Um, as I said earlier, we need a vision, a values-based vision for a new social contract. And I kind of explained what are some of the key principles and guidelines towards that. So within a year, um, that is a year and a half time at a very sensitive time uh, with the U war in Ukraine and, you know, we being at the intersection of the forces, it's a very, very vulnerable terrain that we are working in and, and potentially, like I said, explosive. So it's very key that we steer this kind of social transformation, primarily starting with youth, because youth is using technology in a way that is making them connect faster, easier, and they're eager to connect. They're eager to go beyond their differences or limiting identities. They're more willing to diversify their own uh, identities in order to expand their own connectivity. To them, it is more important to become and belong uh, and authentically be uh, than to create more divisions. Unfortunately, it is us adults <laughs> uh, that are misusing technology and technology is a wonderful instrument that uh, when it is ethically guided uh, can serve in fact to resolve a, a lot of issues. In that sense, I will quickly just notice that as I've said before in other of our gatherings that we are currently humanities is kind of pushed between Scylla and Charybdis of on the one hand existential risks um, that are mounting and becoming more accelerated and complex. And on the other hand, the acceleration and convergence of technologies and everything hinges on social cohesion, on the new social agreement, on the shared direction and the shared universal values that we have to direct technology to solve our existential risks. So what is it that we did in Montenegro, starting with youth. We started with organizing youth around an event that we call Direct Intercultura Montenegro, which means we're branding the country as the land of interculture in order to mobilize the youth to connect well as social artists, using their creative capacities to understand that through self-expression, they can in fact influence policy making. they can in fact influence um, institutions um, and their own movements towards positive change and positive um, transformation that is life affirming and unifying. Then what we did, we created the platform, um, institutional platform based on which we became a part of the program of the government, which meant budgeting and funding these initiatives. And we entered the program, the kind of a long-term also program of the government to fund this. And right now we are in the directorate of the process of funding civil society and NGOs to implement these ideas and to make sure that in a very creative social artist way, we are transforming this society as a model in the region, in Europe, and like I said, hopefully be able to be modeling the UN because we are right now also applying for a security council seat, a Montenegro is implying. So it's very significant that we distinguish ourselves as a candidate country to sit at security council. I mean, these are very concrete and very specific ways in which we are doing this as also a candidate for ascension into the EU um, as a leading country in Council of Europe. So there's a a series of consequences, positive consequences to an initiative like this that reverberates through the social field and through Montenegro's integ uh, integration into global society. Now we're also in the formation of the working group to uh, already work on the national strategy for interculturalism and uh, social cohesion for which we have gotten a stamp of approval by the government, which will become um, as it has been recommended, an umbrella strategy for the development of Montenegro and Montenegro being a multicultural, multi-ethnic, um, ecological state of social justice. All this noble vision that it was put in its constitution is now being enacted through a national strategy this way. So these are just some markers and we're already starting um, uh, intergovernmental committees for interculturalism, social cohesion with neighboring countries. So the 
set of concentric circle of this initiative is already reverberating through the region. And I just wanted to mention a set of specific actions that we have done in order to move the front, move the youth, to move the political will. Thank you. Wonderful example of a, a, a national strategy that may uh, uh, serve and aspires to serve as an example in those concentric circles um, far beyond that particular place. Another um, uh, expression that uh, manifests and, and reinforces Benno's vision of the paradigm shift from bottom up as well. Um, uh, so so I, I thank you for that. Uh, Lucy, I'm hoping you can, in sharing some of your insights on solutions and strategy, move from an example of One Nation to uh, the international, interagency engagement, perhaps through Bridges or other uh, experiences. I was especially appreciative of your bringing in through your introduction, the value of learning from other ecosystems and other wisdom traditions, including in particular indigenous voices who bring that long history of ethics preceding the 20th century constructs we also value. Lucy? Sure, thank you. Um, I'd just like to start by saying I've recently come back from the UN Civil Society Conference in Nairobi. And I was shocked to learn that of the nearly 70 civil society conferences over the years, this is the first one that was ever held in the global south. So that's a scandal, right? But it signposts an underlying change that there has now been one of these conferences in the global south. And to counterbalance that really shameful reality, 40% of the attendants were under 30 now that was stunning, right? So this chimes very much with what Mila was saying about, about youth um, and, and, you know, obviously youth of the future, but there's something happening at the moment. You could feel it at the conference. You know, the youth, the un, the 20 somethings are rising up. They're, they're you know, those who, who were born around the turn of the century, those who are graduating now from universities, and I'm popping that in, for purpose, um, that that yeah, uh, they're bold, they're challenging, and their recurring slogan is "We the people." Right, that's actually what reverberated across the air in, at this uh, sort of uh, civil society conference in, in Nairobi. And um, along with that, there's a sense that for them that the ancestors are communicating. Right, this is there's a significant shift that is happening. So that's the kind of positive bit of, a, of an example in the world, you know, just happening now around the world, how uh, the the youth voice is getting louder. Uh, we're the older lot, um, you know, shifting over a bit. We're making space and they've got some strong and beautiful ideas. They tell a very different story. But in terms of bridges, then, I suppose really what we're trying to do is we're trying to humanize all the disciplines, right? This is this is the, the aim so that we can establish flourishing rather than just sustaining. Sustaining sounds so dull. We need to flourish. Gosh, you know, and that goes beyond the boundaries that I was talking about before and bringing new stories to life. And often these new stories are where the innovation is held uh, and that that's also quite messy so and and something i think that we're not used to allowing in but but messy's um, sort of interesting <laughs> you know this is where some of the fun play happens and i think it's okay uh, for us to to pull on, on the on those sort of messy realities and not be scared of them because you know after all it is people who have created all of these problems, the problems that the SDGs are hoping to address. It's people, it's just people, it's us. <laughs> so, um, you know, sustainability science kind of leans towards technological solutions, but it cannot address those human aspects of adaptation and change. It needs those people who understand humanities, to, who understand humanity, and that is the humanities and the arts, you know, and, and indigenous groups, wisdom which is uh very rooted in in the earth and in the ground often and the humanities you know relies on these really qualitative features 
to tell stories and to use critical thinking. And this is something that I really want to uh, sort of give just a tiny bit of time to here is that they provide a, a, a culturally informed ethical focus that other disciplines have all but abandoned. Um, and they situate uh, findings and understandings historically, politically, economically, and geographically in, in these different contexts. So, um, you know, the humanities brings all sorts of skills to the table that Paul Hulme in 2015 in his book, The Value of Humanities, shows have been left out even from economics. You know, the sciences, the natural sciences, um, for some people they call them the hard sciences, um, and economics, they, they've put that uh, ethical focus to the side in, in recent years to the point where curricula has very little element of criticism in it, um, in them, and that makes it very difficult for people to form any kind of sense of critical citizenship. Uh, you know, and this has been proved again and again that pure science and economics have failed to produce an understanding of that symbolic life that makes makes all of us social and makes uh, you know and therefore human. So it, it's putting all those things back together is what Bridges is trying to do so that we have new questions, we see the problems differently, and therefore we come up with different solutions. And we've got a few projects. You can visit our website. I know I haven't got enough time here to explain. I can see Diana already getting, <laughs> stop talking, Lucy. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, do visit our website. We've got a booklet there of 60 something projects that you can have a look at that are trying to do things differently. Uh, I'm, I'm constrained by this format because uh, I just want to ask more questions and spend more time together with those messy stories that do make things playful and meaningful mm. and juicy. This is how we humanize our life. It's how we live our life. Uh, mm. And the stories will bring me back to, uh, to Dennis, who, who so generously shared uh, a story with us. Um, but I want to first touch on a few things that, that came up referencing the uh, way that we are humanizing our time now and our approach into this future uh, humanizing with an intergenerational lens and an intergenerational shift. By that, I don't mean abdicating our responsibility uh, to the next generation. I'm actually less interested in the next generation and more interested in the now generation of all of us. How do we engage together and give genuine generous, generative voice to uh, those who have not um, had that privilege from whom we have so much to learn and with whom we have so much to engage. The uh, 20 somethings who are bold and beautiful and seeing the world differently are partners with ancestors who they're, they're hearing the, the call the um, communication from the ancestors. And that kind of fluidity is where I think we truly humanize um, how we go forward, not just to uh, a sustainable uh, development, but as you rightly point out, something in which we can truly flourish. That's why I suggest we are in the process of moving into a regenerative system rather than a sustainable Well, Sustainable is a rather low bar. And ironically, it's unsustainable. If we sustained where we are, it's not sustainable. We need that regenerative mode. That's where new questions and new ways of looking, new ways of be belonging and becoming and being and new stories come in. So um, with that, I wanna uh, turn to uh, uh, Dennis, as our storyteller of um, your perspective, where are the solutions and strategies most exciting for you, offering a promise to harness humanity for human security for all? Okay. Thank you, and I uh, hope to be uh, very short, because time is uh, short. Uh, 
I would like to say that uh, in relation to all the discussion today, and especially the whole topic of harnessing the humanities, uh, I would really consider one very important issue relating to humanities uh, in terms of, let's put it, human security, as you say, and I'm happy you are talking about regeneration instead of sustainability. Uh, I believe that the main issue, the main thing about humanities is field work. Uh, there is the big change about knowledge in the 19th century with the humanities is that it introduced the notion of field. That means anthropology had to go, couldn't speculate in an office or in a university about existence of other societies or other cultures, etc. You had somehow not only to go to South America, like Levi Strauss did, etc., but uh, everywhere, Africa, and not only to go and observe, but you had to enter the life of these people. That means I've known people like Opitz or like major anthropologists, they had really arriving in the middle of nowhere to be naked and put and be dressed like the Indians in order to be accepted and to eat and live with these people. I believe uh, if we take the whole uh, history of contemporary or modern, let's say, uh, culture, you'll see that most of the artists, writers, or they, they worked somehow the same way. It is not, Gauguin didn't went like a tourist. Uh, he had really to leave there, to fight with them against the French policemen, uh, to die with them and to abandon all he knew and all he was in order to be part of this group of people. He decided he would share the future. And also, not only a future, a culture. And I believe uh, the problem of our institutions today is that they still, like an old kind of university, working en chambre in closed spaces, and they don't go to the field. At least uh, art historians had very recently, not uh, archaeologists were the first to go to the site, but uh, we have to expect Burkhardt and people like that in the 20th century to find people. They have to go to Italy. They have to go somewhere to look at the works, not to uh, talk about general issues. And uh, to write a language, that's another serious problem of our time. We are all speaking this poor English, which is an institutional language, uh, uh, and we cannot really express ourselves. My English was used to be much better uh, at the time I used. I was working in London or with British people or in America or with American people and having an everyday life in that language. But since I am going from Zoom to Zoom and from uh, administrative papers, etc., I hear all the time implementation and sustainability and all these words at the end they are real jargon and i don't know what they mean at the end. i would really i'm so happy to hear you talk about regeneration you know i mean i know every, every single person would go to a cosmetics to find a way to regenerate their face their skin etc etc i i guess it is about time to regenerate also ideas and thoughts etc the inner cells not only the superficial one and uh, resilience and all these things I'm from colloquium to colloquium they are talking talking about the same things uh, I believe exhibitions museums our fields are linked or should be linked to field work uh, I work myself uh, Mila I was in Montenegro I was in 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 Cetigny at the first Biennale and the second Biennale, and we worked with the people there. And we were living with the people in poor houses. There was only one hotel. It was a ruined hotel in Cetigny, old-fashioned. Uh, uh, and 
who were their major artists from all over the world, just eating with the people and cooking with the people and eating with the people and walking in the city and smoking uh, counterband cigarettes. <laughs> and the only thing, you know, it was a reality. It, it was the same thing in Italy in the 50s or 60s, you know. Uh, uh, I believe this is uh, an important work we have to do. And uh, I, I spent, after working with major institutions, museums in Paris, whatever, I went to Brittany and in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and I was working. Uh, suddenly we had people coming from all over the world, in the middle of the woods, to visit this domain uh, with artists and people they never heard about art. They were suddenly passionate about modern music. I mean, there's all these fake ideas that a simple person, a peasant lady or the, the the baker, the wife of the baker of a small village in Brittany uh, doesn't understand contemporary music. She was amazed to hear a counterbass and say, my God, when my husband is cutting woods, it, does, it make noise, and here I hear a sound come from very well. That's music. That that is a that is a real work to do. That is real, real way to a real way to regenerate meaning, to regenerate uh, our first concern, which is human beings, human life. It's not statistic. It's not so number. So I think that's a that's a great moment to to transition um, to our to our final stage of this session, Dennis. And I thank you for that prompt to regenerate meaning meaningfully. Uh, how we recognize uh, that we are all simple, we are all complex. Uh, that art is uh, uh, our birthright of creativity, not just an artifact but an uh, innovative way of thinking and um, a, a imaginative and nuanced way of understanding who we are in relation with oh. ourselves, each other, and our resources that will be, be the, the core of becoming worthy of trust, rebuilding trustworthiness in our multilateral and very local personal uh, agencies so that we can really bring about human security for all. Um, uh, doing so, I think, will uh, uh, touch on, uh, as you said, the, the inside and outside resilience from our individual microcosms to our collective groupings in community associations, countries, uh, and larger initiatives. Uh, and uh, the, the international community as a whole. So I want to try turning it over uh, back to my colleague, Benno, and thank you everyone for your uh, understanding as we roll with the punches and go with the flow of uh, our, our, our uh, uh, te technical uh, capacity uh, so that um, he can lead us towards um, our, our conclusion. Yeah, thank you very much. It was interesting to listen to to all three of you and also the comments of uh, Diane. Uh, according to my experience, one point has not been approached. And I think that's the institutional organization of the humanities in, in, in comparison to the natural sciences, especially the geosciences. The geosciences are dominating with their vocabulary the whole discourse. So it's very complicated to bring in, for instance, the concept of understanding different cultures, because that's not the point of the natural sciences. They have, and the techno, uh, and engineering, they have what they say, objective knowledge, and they make the conclusion for specific problems, independent of what the meaning of the problem construction of people on site is in their different local places and different cultural contexts. And that's where the humanities really need to come in and not only copying 
the vocabulary of the geosciences and the natural sciences when talking about human security for all or to see just as a technological problems. Of course, the natural sciences are highly important and technologies and engineering is very important as well. But as long as we don't make the bridges between so-called scientific knowledge and everyday practices in different parts of the world, we will not succeed, as Diane and, and several others mentioned, to reach all the political goals in time. And we don't have just to focus on climate change, but we have also to look at the reasons why there is climate change. Funny enough, the geosciences made all the money they have at disposition exactly with the extractive, extractive mode model of taking out energy of the earth and creating somehow uh, the climate change. And to change that, <laughs> that logic, the humanities and also the social sciences have not the institutional background to proceed. And secondly, I think we are living in a visual world, especially. And the visual world is about disasters. You are watching TVs, we have movies. So what the human sciences are talking doesn't have the visual impact or is that easy visual impact than reporting so-called natural disasters and so on and so forth. So I think we have to think together with the arts how to change the problem recognition of our world today and not seeing it just as linked to problematic natural developments. Of course, that's true. But if the humans are behind that, we have to change the everyday practices around the planet and also to change the markets. And what I would say, most importantly, to change the value hierarchy of appreciation. Today, and for many years, success is equals the, the possibility of the amount of energy use. So if success is represented by the amount of energy use you can have, then something is wrong because exactly that we have to change. So we have to change what is appreciated as successful and as the honorable way of lead our lives today and how to change everyday practices respect with high respect for different cultural differences. But in all countries, we need to change probably more or less our practices to achieve our goals and to, to find the right wording or the correct wording, what human security for all includes. I think it's a much wider uh, uh, perspective as commonly is talked about. And I think the WAS project, Human Security of All, is a highly important move in that direction. And it's very important that the voice of the humanities will be raised despite weak microphones in my, in my case uh, uh, and, and, to and to make people listen to their insights and making clear how important these insights are for further problem solutions. So that will be my comment. Highly appreciated, the wonderful examples. And I think it's not an, uh, it's not an accident that Milo is uh, uh, reporting a very successful project because she just have the institutional framing in Montenegro to do so. But in many other places, this institutional context is much weaker for, for what Mila and we have to talk to the general public. And that we need to, to change. And I think we have in the media and in the visual uh, world, we have the art, have arts as the main tool to change that. And that's why I'm thinking arts has the possibility to change our ideas of a, wonder, of a successful and a pleasant and wonderful future. And, and I think that's the, the high role of uh, the most important role of the arts and just not just being something like um, uh, flowers in the ceremony. You know, you're just adding something from the arts to entertain people. That's most of the cases I have experienced where the arts are coming in and the artists are not listened about, have not been, are not heard about their ideas, what uh, 
a respectful way of living together in the future for the whole of humanity could look like. And of course, the humanities have the duty to build these bridges between the different parts of knowledge and bringing them to the everyday, of the level of the everyday practices around the planet under historically and geographically and culturally different uh, conditions. That would be my comment about uh, the idea of the session and the wonderful presentation we could listen to in the last 80 minutes right now. <laughs> what a beautiful encapsulation. Well, Benno, I, we're grateful that you have um, the, the voice restored because you voiced such a beautiful integration of, of the ideas here and what matters so much to bring the arts, not as an afterthought or add on, but as an essential core driver of humanities to humanize uh, how we're shaping our future. Lucy, I see you. Um, let's take just one to two minutes each going around Thank you. and we'll hand it back to us for the next session. Lucy. So, so desperate to speak there. You could see me clawing at the camera. <laughs> so um, I think I think you've raised a really important point, Venno, and we haven't really got enough time to look into it. There's a couple of things I want to say. One, I heard about some giant sculptures of flowers at Kew Gardens, which were designed by an artist to allow people to walk between these huge giant flowers and understand the mastery of a flower like from a bee's perspective. So changing perspective is part of, of this and art can do that. Remember the poem by Dr. Rafit Allery that, that, that he wrote just before he died from a drone strike and that, that went in, in Gaza that went across the internet and everybody's uh, um, page changed to, to show a, 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 a white kite in honor of the poem that he wrote. If you don't know the poem, please look it up. It's called If I Must Die, and it reflects uh, a poem that was written in 1919 by somebody called McKay, who was working for African-American liberation, who, who wrote a poem saying, if we must die. So a shift in perspective is one thing. A change of one's mind is another thing. How to change your mind about what it means to be human, about what it wants, what, what it is we want from this event we call life. And finally, the work that I'm doing with the Kogi in Colombia has radically shifted the way I can understand transdisciplinarity. And, uh, you know, Benno, I think we should talk about that a little bit more because, you know, I can't, I can't give it justice here. But they have literally blown my mind apart in the way that they understand and see the world very, very, very differently. So the only way we can get that kind of understanding is through dialogue through sitting carefully together and listening and taking time. Yeah, stop inventing gadgets. Let's listen to each other a little bit more. Thank you, Dennis and then Mila. Uh, I only want to thank you and to insist that what we call human security is definitely not uh, a police question, is more uh, exactly a way to relate to all these things they make that we don't need to be threatened by what uh, uh, so I mean what uh, Lucy said I mean about the flowers etc I always remember uh, a critique to Levi Strauss that Lyotard did saying that the Indians they don't cut the flowers and I believe that this is exactly perhaps our next step to go and find the flowers and not just go to the flower shop and put some flowers in a vase and uh, decorate our apartments. Uh, that is perhaps a way to find back the notion of time with, without which no human security will be ever possible. If you don't count your steps to go somewhere. You don't take the time to do something. There is no security. So maybe we'll move through this, this garden of uh, flowering human security and um, Mila invite your final thoughts as we wrap up. 
Thank you so much. And I'll lean on what you all have said and Ben so wonderfully summed up, but I've heard from Lucy. Actually, I've heard from Diana something extremely powerful. Art is our birthright. And Diana, just so you know, through trans, uh, <laughs> transpersonal psychology, it's a line from one of my poems. So it is so beautiful to hear it come from another consciousness, knowing that it comes from the unified space. And Lucy spoke of our symbolic life that is in potentia, meaning that it's limitlessly potential. And it is the causal domain from which we generate ourselves, the change of the minds and the hearts that you speak about, and from which we also generate security for each other because security is relational. And we can only be safe and secure together. As you already know what's happening in the world in the youth, an isolated youth, an isolated cell, an isolated nation, what it leads to. We can't do that. We cannot disown our own. How we will integrate and unite and go forward in profound empathy determines everything. It is in fact the time of to be or not to be. And the question rests on how to be together. That's where it rests on. So let us integrate one more piece of our knowledge that has always been nature or culture. No, human nature is cultural is a cultural being, is a zone symbolicon. We are a cultural being and we are a symbolic animal that generates its own meaning, meaning that that's where its saving grace lies. If, as it is, our nature is cultural, then the culture is the way to transform ourselves, our lives, our world, the direction we're going, the paradigm of our development, and to lead towards what Diana and Lucy and Benno and, and Dennis called us to more humane, more poetic, more aesthetic existence, which means to be sensitized to another because the opposite of aesthetic is anesthetic. And this is not the civilization that can be upheld anymore. And the youth knows this. And the youth is showing up in the streets and the youth is willing now to go to violence, to die, to self-sacrifice, to lay their own lives on the line. Because if it's not a purposeful, meaningful, aesthetic life, there is no way to live. So what the world needs and what is already happening is an empathetic revolution. Because what Lucy, you pointed out to this point, if I must die, they're willing to die because seeing the suffering of another is unbearable to our youth who wants to feel together because that's the only way to be. So the empathetic revolution is on its way. Let us harness away for the sake of home and security for all and for thrivability of us all and to, for the goodness and the truth and the beauty of us all. Let us harness it in a way that will lead us to the true, to the true good and beautiful in all of us together. Yeah, thank you, Mila. That was a wonderful last uh, rounding up of, of our discussion and uh, the role of the humanities and arts in different uh, political processes. I, I would say not, not just on human security for all, but this is very encompassing. And I would say thank you to all of you especially also to, to our co-moderator for over bridging uh, the technical difficulties and to take the lead in the meantime, more or less that it was discussed, of course, and also to us, of course, to giving us the opportunity to exchange and to, to reach out to, to more people than just the, the couple of people on the panel and the moderators. And I would leave, thank you, say thank you for to everybody.